Yay, all the clicks. Can you hear me now? Yes! <laughs> oh, God, that commercial will be with us forever. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's Learning Space. We are back from a brief break as I was on vacation in the middle of nowhere with <laughs> really, really sad internet. <laughs> so I'm glad we uh, didn't try and do a live show because the internet was really sad. Um, I am one of your hosts here, Nicole Gallucci. I'm postdoc with the CosmoQuest Citizen Science Project. Hello, everybody. I missed you guys. Hi. <laughs> and through the wall of stuff, I have Georgia, my co-host. Hey, everybody. Georgia. Hey. Uh, so we are back. Uh, we uh, have the same setup as usual. Uh, if you guys want to send us any questions or comments while we're on the air, please use the Google Plus Q&A app. If you're watching this somewhere while it's live on the video at the bottom left there, it should say click to join the conversation. Uh, or if you're watching YouTube, Google Plus anywhere. So go to that Q&A app. We'll be watching that for comments. Uh, we have hellos from Nancy Graziano and from Thomas in Sweden and from Michael. And I already checked the comments before Guido is watching on his mobile device. He says hello from Germany. <laughs> <laughs> I can't beat awesome. you, Nancy. <laughs> I, saw, I, I, saw hello, <laughs> I know, I know. I'm silly. Um, so hi, everybody. Um, and we are going to be talking about, uh, we're going to be talking to Michelle Prisby. So hello, Michelle. Hi, everybody. Uh, <laughs> who is down at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, Virginia, back where I did my uh, graduate work. We'll be talking about uh, a lot of the science education and outreach um, that is being done out of the University of Virginia. So do you want to go ahead and get started, Michelle? Tell us who you are and, and what you do. Sure thing. So it's great to be here today. I did, had no idea there would be an international uh, group of people <laughs> on, so that's fantastic to be talking to all of you. Uh, <laughs> so my position at the University of Virginia is Director of Science Education and Public Outreach in the College and Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. So that's the, the school within UVA where our departments like astronomy, chemistry, biology, etc. are. Um, so in this role, I work with our faculty faculty and our students on different kinds of science outreach initiatives, things that are aimed for public audiences. Um, and a lot of the position is really um, not coordinating the day-to-day -day level of things so much as trying to help build partnerships, um, help find resources, help match people up who are doing similar things and could benefit from working together. Mm -hmm. So what kind of programs are going on at UVA? Yeah, there are a lot of different levels of programs. So um, I can talk about several different ones. Um, sure. In terms of programs that are kind of centrally located that I oversee that cross a number of different departments, uh, one of those is our monthly science cafe. It's called Science Straight Up. I'm sure um, many people in the audience are familiar with science cafes. The idea is that you uh, bring science into a space that's not the kind of place people normally go to hear about science. Um, so a place like a bar, a restaurant, or a coffee shop. And that the scientist, guest scientist is there to lead a conversation on a science topic related to his or her research. Not so much to give a lecture, um, so much as lead a discussion. So the idea is to really uh, foster community conversation about science. So we started one of those here in Charlottesville um, as a UVA program. Oh gosh, I guess it's been about a year and a half now and that's uh, had a really po really good follow following. It's a popular program. Uh, and then a totally different vein, we also around the same, same, same time started a program to uh, provide research internships for high school students. So uh, there have always been high school students doing research in UVA labs, but they all, it's through personal connections, right? Mm -hmm. They have a parent who's a faculty member who knows this other faculty member and gets them into a lab. And we wanted to create a way that um, would be open for high school students through an application process and not just limited to people who know people. Uh, and then we can match those students up with uh, faculty members who are willing to have high school students in their lab and oversee them doing independent research. So that, that program is called HOOSTER, which stands for High School Science, Technology, and Engineering Research. Um, and then, so those are a couple kind of interdisciplinary programs that I manage, but 
uh, happening all over the university are other levels of science outreach initiatives that might be uh, led by student organizations or one particular faculty member. A lot of programs that happen in the schools, so uh, UVA scientists who are going into classrooms and doing demos, leading inquiry-based um, activities with students. Uh, there are programs that involve training teachers, mm -hmm. so providing uh, professional development workshops, either short, like one-day workshops or two-week-long workshops, longer ones that have um, follow-ups throughout the year so to help students, help the teachers with implementing, implementing the activities with their students. Um, so yeah, it kind of kind of runs the gamut. Uh, and then also, of course, um, at UVA, as Nicole knows, we have um, a public uh, n public nights at our observatory. Um, so that's another public outreach venue. And we have, in addition to the astronomy observatories, we have three field stations associated with the university that are not here in Charlottesville, they're scattered all around the state of Virginia. And all of those uh, facilities have public outreach programs as well. Oh, cool. What kind of, what kind of field stations? So uh, we have uh, one, they're kind of all um, natural science based, so two are from the environmental sciences department. Mm -hmm. uh, one is out on the eastern shore of Virginia, so it's kind of focused on uh, coastal mm -hmm. ecology. One is the Blandy Experimental Farm in State Arboretum. Um, and then the third one is Mountain Lake Biological Station, where there's a number of different projects there, but a special focus on evolutionary biology. Cool, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, um, the public nights at, at the University of Virginia are close to my heart. <laughs> right. I... It's, um, from what I understand, the longest running public night um, at an observatory in the U.S. Really? Yeah, it's been going on for many decades, I don't know how many. <laughs> they, they drag you out there when you're a first year and teach you how to use the um, the, the little brass telescope, six inch telescope, which was built in the 1800s, and then eventually you can, you'll learn to use the 26 inch telescope, um, and then once, twice a year they open up the big Fan Mountain Observatory. And those of you who are fans of bad astronomy, Phil Plate's blog, that is also where he got his outreach training because he was a grad student there once upon a time. <laughs> That's a great thing to bring up though, and it's the thing that I think is um, probably most valuable about having universities involved in public outreach is the opportunity to train students, mm -hmm. um, students at the university, whether they're undergraduates or graduate students, in doing public outreach to make it part of their culture. Um, because it's not really something that's been part of the scientific culture necessarily. It's always something that's kind of a little bit on the edge, as I'm sure you realize. And so the more we can involve students in these kinds of activities, the more when they are, you know, grown-up scientists, they will have that be part of their culture. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I could, I, we're bragging a little bit because we love UVA, but <laughs> that's definitely a, a big part of, of the culture, at least in the astronomy department. Uh, how do you get, uh, just one quick thing I wanted to share, uh, Nancy Graziano pointed out there's a uh, similar science cafe type called Astronomy on Tap. If you, any of you are in New York City, check out Astronomy on Tap. A lot of lovely, amazing astronomers run that one. Uh, it's a similar thing. That one they, they do hold in bars and um, you can drink your beer and listen to astronomy lectures, so that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you coordinate with the different, because the different science departments, I mean, they're pretty much doing their own thing. How do you get them talking to each other and coordinated? That is a great question and I'm not sure I found all the answers to it. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're the first one who's had this position at the university, right? You, exactly. You so this is a new position at the university and uh, I probably spent the first, at least the first three months, maybe the first six months, just trying to figure out who all the players were, who all the different entities were who were doing some type of science outreach uh, and may, and connect with them and say, hey, I'm here, I want to know what you're doing, tell me what you need to help you do what you're doing better. Mm -hmm. um, and so simply just being able to have me as one person to who has an inventory of what's going on is a step in the right direction because I guess there really hadn't been a central repository for that information. Mm -hmm. um, so I've tried um, a few different things for, for coordinating and, and most of all um, 
just communicating so that people know they're not alone. Um, so it may not always make sense for somebody in environmental science to actually be collaborating with somebody in astronomy, for example, but it's nice if they can both know that each other have science outreach programs. So um, I have a quarterly newsletter that um, I send out to mostly an internal UVA audience, plus some external entities as well, but um, I'm especially <laughs> focused on <laughs> getting people um, to, at the UVA to know what's going on. And then um, I also, for one semester, had um, brown bag lunches mm -hmm. on a monthly basis and invited both students and faculty who were involved in these kinds of activities to just come and hang out in an informal way to talk about what they're doing. Um, and then the third thing that I've tried to do, it's not necessarily about um, coordinating amongst these entities, but just in a way to uh, support them centrally, I started a mini grants program mm -hmm. for science outreach. So um, faculty and student teams can apply um, who are working on science outreach projects. And it was pretty broadly defined. It had to um, reach a public audience. And it had to involve both students and faculty from the College of Arts and Sciences. And other than that, it was pretty open. Um, and so we've received applications for that, and that's helped to get some new projects off the ground. It's helped me know about things that people were thinking about or doing a little bit, um, you know, bringing them up to a level where it can be something that they share with others. Sure. Cool. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about maybe the student involvement? What do you see as uh, in different departments, grad students getting involved? What are they? How are they getting involved, and what are they getting out of it? Yeah, that's, um, it's pretty neat. So in some departments, um, as you alluded to with astronomy, it's really um, part of the student experience. So the students have to go and help out with um, public nights at the observatory, for example. Um, in other cases, it's uh, something that's by choice. So um, there are a lot of student clubs at UVA that include science outreach as some part of their activities. In some cases, it's the whole club. So for example, we have a group called Chemistry Lead. That's all uh, made up of graduate students and some undergrads from the chemistry department. They go into local schools. Um, they do a chemistry camp here at the university. They recently got a grant to do a teacher workshop. And that is a totally student-based organization um, that students just choose to participate in because they're interested. Um, we also have, as we were talking about before, the Dark Skies Bright Kids group in the astronomy department. And so that was originally started by a faculty member, Kelsey Johnson, who, again, recruited students to help out with doing these after-school astronomy clubs, as well as some other one-off activities. And again, students can choose to participate. Um, but really, when I was doing that inventory of what's going on here, I went through the list of uh, student organizations at UVA, which is something like 500 or more student organizations. Mm -hmm. And I wrote down or, and looked up any of them that might have science outreach as part of what they were doing and then researched, okay, what are they all doing? And there are groups like um, the Society for Women Engineers. Mm -hmm. uh, that is not, outreach isn't necessarily their total focus, but they all they do do programs for girls in engineering uh, to introduce them to engineering topics. Um, they hold a, a weekend where they bring in um, high school girls to learn about what it's like to study engineering in college, for example. So really, the students are doing a lot. Yeah, the, 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 um, the, con, the CIOs, the Contracted Independent Organization yes. is the system. It's, it's you have to, uh, they're very specific. I was involved in, in, in um, oh god, I was involved in, in running an organization completely not related to science while I was there. Um, and it was, they're pretty strict about what you can say, like how you're affiliated with the university. You're not right. a part of the university, but you're at the university. Um, but it is completely student run, and they do get some funds from, from student council, I think. Yes, this, the university tries to make sure that they're not accepting the liability of the organization, basically. But um, many of them are working in collaboration with the department. Um, but I also want to talk about another project that we have going on to support students being involved in this kind of work. And that is um, a program called Community, Communicating Science. And uh, it's a grant-funded program. We got um, 
money from the Jefferson Trust, which is an internal alumni organization here that supports the University of Virginia, to provide a series of training workshops for uh, STEM students, especially graduate students, uh, but also postdocs and undergraduates who are involved in uh, science or engineering research. A series of training workshops for them on communicating science with the public. Uh, different facets of that, including um, social media, mm -hmm. including just kind of the basics of how do you craft a message for different kinds of public audiences, how do you understand your audience. Um, we're going to have one that's focused on K-12 audiences and particularly mm -hmm. communicating um, with kids about your research. And we're to do these workshops, we've been able to um, through this grant funding, bring in uh, organizations who are leaders in this field from all over the U.S. So um, while we have people who are doing this work at UVA, it's great to bring in people who are truly experts in the field to provide this training to our students. And then the second part of the project is to communicate to the students who are participating in these workshops all of the existing opportunities at UVA for practicing these skills, whether it's the public nights at the observatories, um, which, you know, I spoke with the organizer of that, and he said he'd be happy to have a student from chemistry or biology to come and speak at that. It doesn't have to just be students from astronomy. Um, to all of the student organizations who are involved, so we're kind of just directing the students who are coming to the training to all these different opportunities. Very cool. That sounds like, yeah, I would have joined that in a heartbeat. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like awesome. Cool. What kind of response actually, have you had? How many students do you get for that? Uh, well, so we've had, we're going to have a series, the workshop series is four workshops, and okay. we've had one in the spring, um, and three will be in the upcoming school year. So the, the one we held in March, I think we had um, a keynote address that we probably had 70 students at, and then we had a, a more limited registration workshop that we probably had 45 mm -hmm. students at, something like that. Um, but the a great thing is that um, two of the students who came to um, the workshop then were our guest scientists at one of our spring science cafes. So they got to directly practice what they had learned in the workshop by putting together uh, their talks for the science cafe, and they did a really wonderful job. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's really important. Mm. So I had a question back yet at your uh, cafes. How do you choose the topics and the scientists to to do those presentations? Yeah, um, we uh, I and I worked with um, a couple faculty and a few students and a couple postdocs when we were first crafting this idea. And at the time, we made a list of some topics that we felt like were uh, timely and would be of interest. Uh, the Higgs boson. Um, mm -hmm. News had recently come out, so we wanted that one to be on the list, for example. Um, and then I, so that's, that drove some of the early ones. Um, then after that, I just looked to try to have a balance of topics, so not all focused in chemistry or not all focused in physics to cover a lot of different scientists uh, or science fields. I um, tried to uh, think about what the audience was interested in, so we've done surveys at our science cafes to get feedback from the people who are attending on what topics they're interested in hearing about. Yeah. Um, some of it has been driven by um, people I've seen speak and I think would be really great at, in um, that kind of venue. And then there are some things that have been driven by special events. So we wanted to, um, I, I was approached by the folks at UVA who run Humanities Week, which you would think really would not have that much overlap with our Science Cafe. But what they really wanted to do was sponsor a jointly themed Science Cafe that would have a Humanities um, take on science. And um, we ended up having a scientist come and talk who does research in um, why uh, cult cultural effects on, of why um, people accept or do not accept medical um, advice. Uh -huh. So this is very um, you know, you're trying to implement a new medical thing, but people's culture, it doesn't match up with people's culture. Um, so that was a really cool overlap between humanities and, and science. And then coming up in October, this is really pretty cool. Um, we are having 
during a week of October, there's going to be the first ever Virginia Science Festival. So this will be a statewide um, thing with lots of different events happening. Nicole's so excited. I am. Um, I'm going to respect that. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Um, so Virginia Science Festival is happening, and uh, the I think there are four or five science cafes across Virginia. Um, we're all banding together to have our science cafes happen that week and all on the same topic, which will be which will be big data. Ooh, yeah. So pretty awesome. pretty broad. We can interpret it in different ways. So that's going to be this this coordinated effort that will um, drive that particular one. Very cool. Yeah, I see the the uh, the humanities the science straight up with the humanities twist. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, appreciate I like that. That's such a great idea, though. It's just an interdisciplinary cafe. You know, that would be maybe yeah the next step. You know, right. It doesn't have to be. Oh, yeah. um, you, know? you know, a university could do something like that and have it not limited to science. But you know, there's certainly I can speak for the science. Say there is certainly an audience out there, probably in any community, who is interested in getting together to talk about science. And typically at our science cafe, um, we usually have a turnout of an average of 50 people, um, and that pretty much filled the venue that we were at. Mm -hmm. And you know, it varied around that number, but that's the average. And about two thirds of those people were not working or studying in a science field. So the other third were people who maybe had some association with the university or were working as scientists at another organization, and then two thirds not. How, what kind of um, feedback have you gotten from the community from either this program or the other programs that you've been overseeing? Yeah, um, I think I've been really pleased for the the science cafe um, at the community support for that. We just have great turnout. Like I said, typically fills the venue. Have you know hundreds of people on the mailing list, so there have been a large number of people who have come to one or more events. And um, for the high school um, research program, also. Also really good feedback, especially from teachers who recognize that this could be a great opportunity to share with their students. Um, and then I hear all the time from teachers, local teachers, that they want ways to connect with the university. So they're appreciative of opportunities for professional development, groups that can come to their classrooms, um, and other ways that they can connect with the university. Sure. And it's not just stuff that's in town. There's a lot of outreach to the rural parts, too, as well, because Charlottesville since you know, right in the center of Virginia. Yeah, yeah. So we, um, you know, some of those programs do reach beyond our little community of Charlottesville. And like I mentioned, we've got the field stations that are in totally different parts of the state. So um, Blandy Experimental Farm, for uh, example, has a very strong school program where they have hundreds of school kids who come to their site for hands-on learning and um, that's reaching a really different different audience than we reach here in Charlottesville. Same thing on the Eastern Shore. Um, they actually have had um, at our field station on the Eastern Shore a high school research internship program in the summer similar to the one that we have here on grounds at UVA um, but due to their location um, they're reaching a population of students who's really different than the population in Charlottesville. It's a county that's majority minority, much lower income, um, students probably who are much less likely to go into science uh, without having that kind of um, opportunity. Cool, cool. Yeah, I just had a, an interdisciplinary experience of my own. I was just doing a planetarium show with a group of 8th and ninth graders for a summer camp here. Um, <laughs> And we got into extremophiles, and I started asking these biology questions, and I'm like, I look over at the camp leader, he goes, I have a degree in biology. I'm like, okay, so we have to take a team. Uh, so that really reminds me of another program we have coming up next week, which is uh, another is interdisciplinary one um, that has been across our engineering school and the College of Arts and Sciences. It's called BLAST. It stands for Building Leaders for Advancing Science and Technology. And it is essentially a summer camp, um, a summer program for students from all over Virginia, um, especially targeted at some of the rural areas like Southwest Virginia. And they will come to UVA, or this, we had it last summer, we have it again this summer. They come to UVA um, and do hands-on activities in science and engineering. Um, for example, they uh, 
will have an activity where they build a, a mock um, Mars rover that they then deploy kind of on Mars. They deploy it in a place they can't see it um, and are operating it through video and they have to accomplish different challenges as they go along. Um, they have another project where they build a solar car that has to be able to tow a weight. They have a project in chemistry where they're learning to identify unknown chemicals using a spectrophotometer. Um, and all of these projects involve uh, a lot of teamwork and working together, a little bit of element of competition. Um, and then we have evening programs where they hear about careers in STEM, talk to UVA students who um, are studying in STEM fields. So we'll have, that starts on Sunday, we'll have 80, uh, yeah, 80 rising ninth and 10th graders <laughs> to do that program. Awesome. <laughs> With all these different programs, what, um, what are some of the biggest challenges that you see facing these groups that are doing outreach and education right now? Um, well, I think at a university, the biggest challenge, um, especially when so much of the work is happening um, by students and student organizations, is just keeping up the momentum when you always have people leaving every single year, because that's what students do. They're supposed to graduate. Um, and just having um, to be able to continue a program um, when the person who originally started it and was so fired up about it maybe has moved on uh, can be tough. So, you know, sometimes it might mean that something that was good and has worked well isn't going to continue because there just isn't somebody who can, um, who has that same enthusiasm or ability to pick up the reins. Um, and, you know, in other cases, it's something that you could pass off to somebody else. Uh, it just depends. But I'd say that's probably the biggest challenge. Um, just it's really kind of, my other background is um, working with volunteer organizations um, mm -hmm. and doing volunteer management and in many ways um, this is like volunteer management because the faculty or st and students who are involved might kind of think of themselves as a volunteer. It might be something that they don't absolutely have to do. Um, so thinking about volunteer recruitment and retention applies in the same way. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's true. How, um, what kind of uh, advice can you give to other departments or students or faculty that are looking to, to grow their outreach programs in universities? Yeah, um, well I would suggest, um, one thing I would suggest is connecting to um, a larger national organization. I don't know if it's exactly an organization yet, but it's in the process of being one. Um, if you Google Broader Impact Summit, Mm -hmm. um, you will find a website with information from a couple of, of conferences that have happened that have been attended largely by people in positions like mine or positions that focus on National Science Foundation type broader impacts at universities. And um, that's just a really good group to connect with um, to find out what's going on at other universities and how people are approaching this. Mm -hmm. um, it's always better to find colleagues who are doing something similar to what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so I would I would pass that recommendation along for sure. Let's um, put another thing. URL. It's broaderimpacts.net. Oh, there we go. <laughs> awesome, broaderimpacts.net. And um, I guess my other piece of advice would be, um, you know, if somebody was in an administrator role like mine, um, I would just say harness the student power as much as possible because um, they're just so um, great at doing this kind of work and are so fired up about it. Um, and then the third piece of advice I would have, again, if somebody is, is in the situation that I'm in, if you can get even a little bit of funding so that you can do mini grants or something else where you can actually um, provide some support to people who want to do this kind of work, that will make you a lot of friends. What kind of projects have the mini grants um, been funding? Yeah, so let's see. Um, one is um, a group of students and a faculty member in environmental sciences who are working with a local high school to engage students in environmental science research that uses their school garden. Um, so they had this school garden and they wanted to do something that was academically meaningful 
um, with it. So they've been um, working with a small group of students on doing real research projects. Um, another thing, um, kind of in a totally different vein, that we helped support was a Darwin Day event. So um, many places uh, celebrate Darwin's birthday. It happens in February. And our biology department um, had an open house that was open to the public where people could come and um, visit the different labs in evolutionary biology, hear about the research that's happening there. And they also had a keynote speaker that was um, somebody chosen to, uh, who could speak well to a general audience, people who weren't just scientists. Um, let's see, I can't even remember all of the projects on this spot, but um, many of them, I would say, have focused on um, K-12 audiences. Oh, another one to mention would be our Dark Skies Bright Kids um, group has funding for their star party, so this is um, a big uh, astronomy outreach public event aimed at families that will happen in August at um, a cidery, actually. Um, I know. Oh, in County, so it's in a, a great place for dark skies, and um, they'll have all kinds of um, youth-oriented, family-oriented activities, uh, including their inflatable planetarium and lots of viewing of the night sky through telescopes. Yeah, they moved it to the Cider Works last year, I think, and I'm, I'm still on all the emails, and I'm like, I'm so jealous, guys. Yeah, and they really, I mean, they moved it last year, and they had... I think they doubled their turnout, yeah. so they're, they're expecting to potentially double it again this year if they have good weather and get their publicity out. That's fantastic. What kind of turnout do they usually get? I mean, you know, in the hundreds of, of people, I'm, I don't remember how, what the total number was, but yeah. I don't think they could have managed much more than what they had last year. Which yeah, I it, uh, it used to be held at whatever school had just had DS, or one of the schools, yeah. so it attracted a lot of people from that particular community, but being at the Cider Works, I think it was more central. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds lovely. Of course, very, it was very Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, and I, you know, at least my first year, I tried to get to all of these fun events, right, so that I could see what was going on. I don't get to them all now, but yeah. <laughs> they're all very fun. <laughs> Are you able to do any following of your, especially like the, the high school students that get involved with your programs and, you know, it would be great to see if there was some impact in that. Did they maybe choose a STEM career? Did they, you know, change their interest a little bit or involvement? Do you have it? And it's I hard, I know. Do you have a chance It's to a do? really important, important question um, that I don't have an answer to yet because I've only been here for two years, so not really long enough to do any sorts of longitudinal studies. But I would um, point you to another program that is called Pathways to Science. It's at Yale. And they actually um, worked, they have an Office of Science Outreach that worked with all of the entities at the university who were involved in science outreach um, to kind of band together and agree to put their events that they were holding all in the same database and track um, attendance from all of these. And then they also partnered with the school system to sign students up to be part of the Pathways to Science program and then be able to track the outcomes for these students. So they had to, you know, that of course required um, IRB and agreements with the schools um, to be able to collect those kind of data. But those students who are signed up for Pathways to Science get invited then to all of these different science events that happen on their campus and then they can track what happens to these students. <laughs> so it's actually a really, really cool model. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. Getting the IRB and and having the long term infrastructure in place to follow a group like that is is a big deal. Yeah. That's probably why we don't see it as often. Right. Yeah. Not very many people are doing it, especially. Uh, you know, I I think that the noteworthy thing is that Yale was able to get all of their disparate entities, whether it was the biology department, the astronomy department, the chemistry department, to kind of buy into this. Um, and that's of course hard at any um, dispersed institution. <laughs> decentralized institution. Right. Sure. But yeah, that's that's um, definitely something I think um, more institutions should consider. Cool. I had another question, but it flitted away from my brain again. <laughs> it was related, but that's fine. Um, I want to remind everybody, if you uh, have any questions or comments, you can use the Q&A app. 
Um, Nancy asks, have you had any former participants move on to be part of the outreach presentation or more professional team? Yeah, I, I, not to my knowledge, but I, this position hasn't very, existed for very long. It's only been <laughs> two years. So yeah. um, I will say in that general vein, um, although we weren't responsible for this exactly, um, the Mars rover activity that I was talking about before with the BLAST camp is actually run by the robotics team from one of the local high schools. Um, and so it's all high school students who do that educating of the other high school students who are here visiting from all over Virginia. It's really cool. They do such a fantastic job. They set up this amazing uh, robotics course and they take on all these different roles as mentors and bankers and whatever to oversee the whole operation. Jen. Yeah, I just saw a bit of the first robotics team at a Maker Fair uh, in Kansas City, and they just had this whole pen set up, and all the teams brought their robots, and they were tossing balls, and I don't know. <laughs> I, I haven't been too closely involved, unfortunately. I'm usually uh, got something going on. I was asked to, to judge one recently, but... Um, yeah, that, that robotics thing is a whole other level of awesome. Right, it is. And it seems to be um, a way that a lot of students get interested in yes. um, STEM kinds of things. In fact, yeah, our Teen Science Cafe, this coming up this semester, one of their big things is they want robots. They want robots. <laughs> <laughs> Teen they Science Cafe. Robots. So I need to bring them robots. And they want <laughs> nanoparticles. I don't know if they want them together, but they, they want robots and they want nano things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. That's my uh, and then also we have a comment from Michael Jobin who says, "What a powerhouse in outreach that Michelle." So yay! Kudos <laughs> from Michael. And uh, I also want to say hello to Hugo Burnham who who is also in the comments and one of the other pages. So what? Well, <laughs> better late than never. <laughs> That's okay. Yay! Um. So uh, I know I know you are are sadly moving on from this position, but you're going to be working on a really interesting citizen science effort that you've worked with before. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that as well? Sure. Yes, um, I am actually leaving this position that now that I've talked all about it uh, here at UVA. So I feel like it was like a bait and switch or something. Are, are you passing um, it, passing on the crown to to somebody who? I don't know yet. Um, you know, universities tend to be sort of slow moving, so I don't know yet um, how, if, when they'll fill the position. It probably will not be like the day that I leave, I get to pass oh. the to the right person. Oh, um, mm. But I'm, I'm hopeful that um, it, there will be somebody. But meanwhile, I'm making sure the programs continue. So our science cafe is going to be run by another person. I'm looking for somebody who's going to run our high school research internship program, et cetera. So, um, our science mini grant, uh, out science outreach mini grants program. We're looking at ways to continue that. So I feel like the functionality yeah. um, will continue, but it is really nice to have a central person who knows what's going on. <laughs> yeah. All that. Okay. So um, don't know exactly what'll happen here, but um, I headed back to Virginia Tech, um, where I worked with previously in the Department of Forest Resources and Environmental Conservation on a program called the Virginia Master Naturalist Program. It's an environmental volunteer program where we train people from all over Virginia in natural resources kinds of topics. Um, and then they go out and do volunteer work, either educating other people about natural resources, doing stewardship projects to um, improve um, habitat in the state um, or in citizen science, so collecting data um, for nature-based monitoring types pro type programs. Cool, very cool. But you're staying in Charlottesville. I'm staying in Charlottesville, so <laughs> I plan to still be an attendee of our science cafe. I won't be the person running it. Um, although I, I will say... a trip around a science cafe. <laughs> I, um, I, I thought about taking it with me, right, because I thought I really don't want to see this go away, and I didn't know if there would necessarily be another me to take it on, and I thought, well, I can still run this program. It's not that hard to run a science cafe. I could still do this, and it wouldn't have to be a UVA thing, but I felt like it really ought to be a UVA thing just because it's such a great way to, it's such a great venue to give to our scientists, whether yeah. students or mm -hmm. faculty, um, to talk to a different kind of audience about what they do. So I felt like it, it should stay connected with the university. So I'm glad that, glad that it will be. Um, but all that to say that there are science cafes that are run 
not through an organization like a university, just independently through people who want to foster dialogue about science in their own community. So I'd really encourage people, if your community doesn't have a science cafe, you can start one, and it doesn't have to be an institutional kind of thing. Mm -hmm. so there's a, a loose, there's like a loose association, right, at sciencecafes.org. Yep, yep, and then there's kind of an international one, um, Café Scientifique. Café Scientifique, that's right. <laughs> so yeah, so there are resources to help you get started or find exactly. one near you that you just never heard of. Yeah, a lot of them some yeah. just spur out of meetup groups, kind of. Yeah. Um, but it's good to have somebody, somebody driving. It's good to have somebody driving <laughs> who's passionate about it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Sciencecafes.org, I think, is where you can find them in the U.S. And then I don't know if there's a separate site, because that one's sponsored by the NSF. Um, but, yeah, Café Scientifique. Don't ask me to spell that. that <laughs> that's more the international <laughs> version. That one, Café Scientifique has a listserv also that um, is a good place for posting questions if you run a, a science cafe and want to talk to other people. Somebody recently sent something out on the listserv. Um, asking for examples of um, people having a science cafe associated with a sci-fi movie. So mm -hmm. like a current sci-fi movie that's out and, and having somebody speak um, beforehand or lead a discussion beforehand or afterwards. And they had some good responses from, from institutions or, or science cafes that do that kind of thing. So it's a good place for resources. That's totally the way to do it. They do that for First Fridays at the Science Center in St. Louis here. Oh, um, nice sci-fi theme, they'll show the movie, free tickets for the movie, and then um, they have a whole bunch of other activities that are around, located around it. So if you're in our area, <laughs> this week, they're doing one on, on the search for extraterrestrial life, and CosmoQuest will be there. So, <laughs> And hopefully they'll bring the tardigrades out, too. I'm so excited. Oh, I do love tardigrades. Oh, no. They actually, you, just, like, anywhere there's wet moss, apparently there's tardigrades. So they yeah, put wet my... moss in a petri dish, and you can see them in the microscope. In my previous, previous job, I um, worked at an environmental education center in Great Smoky Mountains National Park as the citizen science director, and so I worked with the park on all kinds of different research projects that we could involve the public and students in, and one of those was collecting tardigrades. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, so yeah, sciencecafes.org is, is kind of the help you network nationally, and then teamsciencecafe.org, shameless plug, I'm going to start working for them soon, um, <laughs> is uh, some of the, the, middle, the middle school to high school level um, that are being set up around the country as well. So Fabulous. Yeah, I'm excited. I, I got to speak, I get to speak for one of them last year, which was really cool, and then... Uh, they, 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 they actually train the scientists on how to speak. Yeah, I was going to ask, do, um, how do you find scientists? What do you look for in speakers? Um, who do you know is going to be good for these kinds of things? So um, I will say first that I consider our science cafe to be a fairly low-risk situation. Mm -hmm. So if we bring in a scientist who turns out to be kind of a dud, it's <laughs> like, oh, well, so that wasn't a good use of somebody's hour of time. But we didn't pay them. Yeah. We're not paying our venue. You know, it's it's okay. So I actually think it's like a good test ground um, okay. for trying out a scientist before putting them into some other public outreach situations. Okay. Um, but that said, um, I mostly uh, just really try to communicate well about what we're looking for. So I always say we want you to give an introduction that's just 15 or 20 minutes it would be okay if it was 30, but I tell them 15 to 20, right? Because they're going to go over <laughs> and it'll probably end up being 30. And um, I really try to emphasize that it should not be a public lecture. We mm -hmm. don't let them use PowerPoint, so that already puts people in a different zone um, <laughs> and, and, and solves a lot of problems um, before, before they could happen, I suppose. Um, and then... I, you know, ask them to tell me a little bit about their topic um, so that I kind of have a sense for what they might talk about. And then the other thing that we do as sort of prep work is um, we have our uh, local radio station interview them um, the week before, early in the week before the Science Cafe. So they get a little practice just talking to somebody about Which their station? research. I'm kind of a preview. What's that? Which station? The Okay. Um, they get a little practice talking to somebody, um, get a sense for some of the questions that the audience might ask them. 
Um, and, and I got that idea from a science cafe down in Georgia, I think. That's a great idea. A yeah, great vet, vetting your scientists is, is a good idea. <laughs> it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty low risk if you're putting them out there once for an hour. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, it is. I, we, haven't had, we haven't had anything that I would say was a disaster. <laughs> Not one. I would, we've had some that were livelier than others. Uh-huh. But some of the ones that were one person's favorite were some somebody else's least favorite and vice versa. So mm -hmm. I think if you have a diverse array of topics, then it'll probably work out. Um, yeah, so it's <laughs> oh, okay. Um, speaking, yeah. speaking of potential disasters, uh, Michael Jobin asks, um, do you ever have people at these events that confuse bad science or pseudoscience with normal science um, in any of these situations? Yeah, so, um, you know, we definitely get some questions at the science cafes that are, um, I would say they're confusing bad science or pseudoscience. It's just they have questions that um, definitely let on their personal biases. Um, <laughs> we've had a few, a few medical-related science cafes and had people talking about vaccines. Um, and concerns about vaccines that aren't necessarily scientifically founded. Yeah, you, um, you definitely get that in Charlottesville. <laughs> yeah, for example. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, I think um, our the science cafe that we had that was the Joint Humanities one mm -hmm. really showed us to think about people's culture and where they're coming from as being part of the mix. So we can give them the correct scientific information um, but should be respectable, respectful of their perspectives coming from a cultural um, way of looking at it. I, another medical one that came up at our last one, um, we, our last one was about um, microflora in your gut, so gut bacteria, and uh, people had some specific questions about, oh, well, shouldn't I eat this Thing, or should I, you know, I should take this, which one of these probiotics should I take? Um, and our scientists were really great about explaining that the, the science isn't there yet. We actually don't know which of these microbe species um, are the best. We, we think we know that a diverse mix is good, right. but we don't know that this particular species is going to have this particular effect um, in most cases. So you know, advice to, yeah, there we go, um, advice it. to take this one particular species or try to increase this one particular species, the science just isn't backing it up yet because we're not there yet. More research needs to be done. Right, right. No, I love that graphic. I don't know. <laughs> amazing. It is. That's beautiful. And that just kind of goes up all over town, right? Yep, we use it electronically and then also on posters um, around town. That's so cool. That's so cool. So what do your scientists think about their experience? Do you talk to them afterwards and what kind of reactions? Was it, um, you know, what they expected or some of them are like never again and or some, you know, sign me up. I want to do it again. Uh, you know, some of them have kept coming as audience members. So I take oh, that cool. to be a pretty good sign. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they have sometimes participated to help answer questions um, or ask questions but also answer questions um, and participate in the discussion at events that weren't even the ones where they were the guest scientists. So that's, that's a great. Good idea. I don't think I've scientists in the audience just Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've had anybody who's who's had I don't not just limited to to the science cafes, but with any of the outreach events I've worked with, I don't yeah, think I've ever had a scientist say, yeah. boy, I don't want to do this ever again. <laughs> it's usually the opposite, just in my looking, in throughout my career, it's usually the opposite that, um, you know, you can provide scientists with a good experience and they're probably going to like it and want to do it again. There's yeah. a bit of a self-selection, too. The ones who are really bad at it, you just know to stay away. <laughs> I hate to say it, but you know that you know that they're out there. <laughs> right? Yeah, and they're probably never like I don't know. I just they they probably just have not ended up even being on my radar screen because yeah, because they're mentioning no names. <laughs> right, and that's another thing too that um, going back to your question about sort of how do I do my job here at the university um, and what advice I would have for other people. You know, I think if I had started out trying to with a goal of getting every scientist involved in some sort of public outreach at UVA, that would have been 
awful and totally not successful. <laughs> um, it is not everybody, it's not everybody's thing. It'd be great if we can make it more people's thing, and I think doing that through students is the way to go, um, or providing people with training and resources um, is great, but definitely find and use the people who already are interested in it, and especially people who are on the cusp, people who maybe have some skill or interest, or who did it as graduate students, but don't know how to get involved with it as faculty. Yeah. Cool. cool. Awesome. Well, it sounds like you've had a really great experience um, kind of wrangling all of these cats. <laughs> for the it's, last been fun. it's been fun. I will say that, um, yeah, it's it's been interesting, and working with students has definitely been my favorite part um, because I just think their energy is so infectious, and I'm really glad to see them um, going out and, again, like I said, changing the culture of science so that public outreach is, is more of something that people do. Yeah, Kelsey used to yeah, say, like, really all you got to do is, is give, you know, give, give grad students a few donuts, and they will just rule the world. <laughs> right. Feed us at those weekly DSPK meetings, and then everything would happen, you know? It's, it's great, great, too, because I've had some students come to me to, um, you know, ask about career advice, mm -hmm. and it, that's just great, because I was once a graduate student in the sciences who had interests in a career in public outreach, and it's hard to find help sometimes, and it's hard to find somebody who um, can can give you advice, so it's been fun to talk to those students, too. Cool. What kind of advice do you give them? I, I get similar sorts of questions sometimes, and it's like, ooh, okay, here's my thoughts, but there's no one solid answer. What kind of advice do you give them? Uh, yeah, I mean, again, yeah, I don't think I have uh, one solid answer, but I just encourage them to um, not be afraid to take the time to do side projects that are in, are public outreach related. I mean, that's what I would definitely tell graduate students. Um, it is definitely based on my own personal experience, not any sort of scientific study of how you get into this field, but I did a lot of, of side projects as a graduate student that related to public outreach, and they all were really meaningful in terms of my career track later on, even though I, they weren't all things that I got publications out of. They were things I could put on my resume um, and were really useful and gave me skills that I still use today. Cool, very cool. Awesome. Um, so if we don't have any other questions, we, we do have a science love in caps from Michael Jobin. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. one. Yeah. And something about dueling science, which I, I missed what that was in reference to, but okay, dueling science. Um, so yeah, I want to thank you, Michelle, so much for, for coming on the show um, and talking with us and sharing with us. I know you you just finished an office move and doing all the things. So No, yes, hence the very blank wall behind me. I'm in a brand new office, but I enjoyed this so very much, and I really thank you for inviting me to do it. And um, I will miss your emails because I'm. I think I get the quarterly newsletter through DSVK still. I don't oh, know. Good. Okay. Great. Great. So um, hopefully, um, there, the, all of that great stuff will continue. I know. I know. Science straight up will. So definitely keep an eye out on that. And if you come back to Charlottesville, come to our science cafe. Totally want to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So look up a science cafe near you. It's 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 a really great thing, and, and see about starting one near you if there isn't one. <laughs> yeah. Or who? You know, when you go to travel and you're looking at things to do in the city that you're visiting, why not see when their science cafe is? There you go. There you go. So thank you so much, right. and thank Thanks you so everyone for coming back this week after vacation time. Mm -hmm. uh, next week we will be talking with Kevin Govender for the Office of Astronomy Development down in Cape Town, South. Africa. Africa. He's a really cool guy, uh, featured in one or many, one or a few videos that um, uh, I, I had done with some people without astronomy. So we'll be talking about using astronomy outreach around the world <laughs> uh, in developing nations and um, how astronomy and science can contribute to development and education. So that'll be next week. Um, I think all the other shows are still on hiatus, Georgia? Um, I was just thinking about that the other day. I think, I think, I think, I think, I think so, so because yeah. yes, I haven't heard about anything recently. Okay. Again, so yeah, so astronomy cast and weekly space hangout are on hiatus. Oh, yeah. After Dragon Con, 
Um, and I think the virtual star party will be the first Sunday of August, uh, since they're, they've moved to a monthly format, so you guys can join them there. Uh, quick shout out for those of you who are in the Atlanta area or who are planning on going to Dragon Con, we are starting to put out our call for volunteers. If you can help us with the CosmoQuest booth at Dragon Con, if you can donate a few hours, uh, helping out of the booth, mostly you are going to be talking to people about citizen science and how cool it is and get them to try, try the site on one of the laptops that we'll have on display there. Um, so if you are going to Dragon Con and you can help us out with a few hours of your time, uh, you can email us at getinvolved at cosmoquest.org um, or just, you know, ping one of us on social media if we're already connected there and uh, we would love to have your help for that. Um, that, that is a huge event, and it really happens because we have awesome volunteers. And uh, actually, I don't, can, I, can I, even though this is part of the research study, can I divulge, or actually, it's, it's not research, it's the, the evaluation. Um, can I divulge that uh, one of the biggest draws in the, so we, we do uh, poll people about what they think about the booth after the fact for our own evaluation purposes, and one of the big things we get is how nice the volunteers are and how helpful <laughs> they are. So, yeah, people don't just come to the booth to see the shiny things. They come to talk to people. And so, you know. Shiny people, yes. Yeah, they come to talk to happy, shiny people about science. So um, you guys who have been volunteering with us have done a great job. That that ended up being one of our number one draws is, is helpful volunteers. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah, Dragon Con, get involved at CosmoQuest.org or ping one of us on social media. And Dragon Con is Labor Day weekend. Right. Labor Day weekend, Atlanta, okay. Georgia. Also, I should put in a plug for the Star Party. Again, if you're coming to Dragon Con or if you're in Atlanta already, August 28th is the Thursday night. Right? August 28th is the Thursday night before Dragon Con starts at Emory University. Go to atlantastarparty.org. Uh, you can get tickets to come see me and Pamela. Um, and I think uh, Derek Demeter's coming back, so we'll have three astronomers on top to talk about astronomy. Uh, hopefully the skies will be clear. They'll open up the telescopes. That's atlantastarparty.com. Sorry. Uh, proceeds will go to um, uh, the Alzheimer's Foundation of America, and uh, a certain small percentage will be going to CosmoQuest. So come check that out. Uh, don't you guys start having astronomy on tap there? Don't you guys go to a bar and talk to Atlanta probably does. I, I've been well, you guys. What? You guys. Oh, at DragonCon? Yeah. We're at the bar all the time. That's what I thought. <laughs> you, 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 yeah, when the booth closes, where do you think we go? <laughs> Come to the Hilton Bar. Yet. We'll probably be drinking and chatting with celebrities from sci-fi shows if we can talk to them about science. <laughs> But, yeah, we got to do it. I think Pamela, Pamela's like BFFs with Teal from Stargate now because they were chatting about science at <laughs> a couple different conventions. It's 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 too much fun. Good so, fun. Yeah, .com, check out the tickets. There's also a um a, a silent auction that's starting online now and will continue through the event. So even if you can't go, you can bid on cool stuff from our friends from uh, Atlanta and from Mad Art Lab and all the cool people. Um, so, yeah, that's what we have coming up. Michael Jobin says, I want to volunteer at Convergence. <laughs> you just missed it. You couldn't go this year. Uh, Convergence is another con that uh, I was at recently, and we had, um, Michael, if you really want to volunteer at Convergence, I will get you to the person who runs that one. <laughs> Give your information to the person who runs that one, um, runs the, the Skepticon stuff, so... All right, thank you, everybody. Thanks for the discussion. Thanks for the questions, and we'll see you next week. All right. Bye. Bye. This is my new sign for science. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Bye.